Hi, Rick Clark, fifth generation farmer, West Central Indiana. Russell Hendrick, first generation farmer, North Carolina. All right, does anybody have any just follow-up questions from the panel or from Rick's keynote? Um, I can kind of tell you what the last group, the direction they went. Anybody wants to go there? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just had one, one thought that came up um, for you, Rick. When you were talking about painting your cover crops, your cereal rice, you know, you're 50,000 acres. Right. I was wondering what your staging was. Uh, currently, we okay. The question is, uh, what is our spacing on um, our our no-till drill? Currently, it is a 10-inch spacing, and but we are upgrading that no-till drill this fall. It's going to be seven and a half. But what we what we're doing is we we've got a 70-foot air boom, and we're broadcasting 50 pounds over the top, and then we're coming back and 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 no-till drilling 100 pounds. So you've got that way, then it kind of takes the, 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 the spread out. You've kind of got a broadcast across the whole profile. And then if the 50 for some reason doesn't grow, you've at least got 100 that you, you planted with the drill and got seed to soil compound. Okay, what you might say, that's pretty smart. Yeah, how about that? Sometimes uh, the blind squirrel finds an acorn <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> what else? I'm not a big proponent of aerial seeding, but, but sometimes that's the only thing you can do to get it out there. I, I've not had very good success with it. So what we've done is we've shortened our cash crop. We've We've, we've got cattle grazing, we've got regen, we're trying to rotate to where we can get out there by October the 10th with these cover crop packages because the, the, the success of next year's cash crop begins with the success of this year's cover crop. It's that important. It has to be out there on a timely fashion. If, if anybody's got any I guess you could take this time if you've got a specific question to your farm to, to ask a question about if you, you know, there are, like, like Rick said, there's no dumb questions. Yeah. Um, it'd be a good time. And you said earlier, with all that heavy cover crops, you had a planter that would go through it. What model producers or what caps do you have on your planter? Okay, we're, you're going to get two different answers. I went first last time. I'm going to let Russell go first, then I'll go this time. So, uh, yeah, me and me and Rick are definitely different in our planter approach. Um, my planter is kind of like a safety blanket for a kid. Um, I run coulters. Um, I run row cleaners. Our row cleaners are bolted up. The reason we run row cleaners is it moves the residue around the gauge wheels. Some of my some of my cover crops have been eight inches, 10 inches deep after the roll. And it really makes it hard for us to get a consistent seed depth. So the row cleaners work good. We in furrow fertilizer, will apply sugar in furrow. Um, we use humic acids to kind of help stimulate biology in the, in the furrow when we're planting. And then also um, part of our nitrogen management, I don't like spraying nitrogen. So we put a little nitrogen on with the planter. And we did, we've either banded it on top or we actually have a two by two system that, that runs with the planter that we inject, you know, do that now. So you're rolling the cover crop down before you plant? We, we used to terminate and then roll. And the problem is, is if your roller width doesn't match your planter width, it'll come back up, or start wrapping. Um, Yetter uh, has a stalk devastator for a corn header. We actually applied that to our corn planter in the front. So we roll and plant in one pass. It saves us about eight to $10 an acre. And, you know, it's hard to find people that even want to ride in tractors anymore. So that's less time I had to spend in the field as well. Um, to give you an idea, the first, the year before we got the, the rollers on the planter, we rolled 800 acres, seven foot at a time. I mean, the nosebleed, if you've never had cereal rice, six, seven foot tall pollinating, it will make your nose bleed for days um stop up planter filter or tractor filters so i mean you know our and our soils changed so much um from you know new ground that we may pick up being hard as, as concrete and you know mellower ground that we've had in these soil health practices 
planner set up, um, it, there, there is a picture of the room unit in the slide presentation if you want to go there and look at it. No, no row cleaners, no coulters, double disc opener from Prescription Tillage Technology, a company near Iowa, and spader wheel closing wheels from uh, Steve Martin, Martin Till in Kentucky. Um, we do have Delta Force on the planter, which is a hydraulic lift and down force. But as long as we've been at this, we've got good tilt, we've got good mellowness to the fields, we've got root systems working. Uh, our planter is in the lift mode when we plant, not the push mode. So we are actually running negative down, uh, applied as applied down force, we're running negative because we're lifting that row unit. A lot of times we are planting into that living um, biomass, that living cover. So you don't quite get the effect Russell's talking about because each gauge wheel is just on a spot in that versus the roller laying that whole area down. And again, I mean, yes, we've done the same thing and it's, it's difficult to keep that depth accurate then. So we try to go through um, before we do anything. And another reason why is it does, well, I guess I have, shouldn't say any height, but I've done rye that's over my head. And as long as you don't detach it from the ground, it wiggles through and comes out the back of your plant. But if you go in there and do something prior, you're going to be vulnerable for wrapping. And that's when the headaches occur. Yes. You commented about planting bees three inches deep. Yes. So they don't start to fall, or what's your reason? For that, that that was for protection. I thought it was to keep them safe and down there all winter. Right. We had such a warm winter; they actually came out of the ground, okay. and they got two inches tall. And then we had a, a Arctic blast from Canada come down, and I figured they were gone, and they survived, okay. and they they came out of of the spring. And they are growing right now with the wheat, and they're they're climbing right with the wheat. So the test so far looks pretty good. But yes, the goal was to plant them deep for protection. A follow up on that: will you plant your corn? Will you plant two to three inches versus a few inches? Corn is three inches deep. Beans are inch and a quarter. I get asked why you plant so deep. I, I don't know. I, I'd like the depth. I mean, we're, we're going through so much fibrous roots in that top two, three inches. I want to get through and get that seed in a really nice bed because that, that if you're out there when you're supposed to be, that seed slot just falls back together with all those roots and, and the fibers. I really like three inch, two and three quarter to three inch. I really prefer that for the corn bed. Yeah, I found that cutting. Like cutting fabric. Yes. And I can see what you Yeah. More yes. What's your best? Um, our neighbors put beans in the ground half inch deep. We put our beans inch and a half, two inches. Yeah. Um, corn, the first time we broke 300 bushels, we were three, three and a quarter inches deep. And right. I don't know. I pay attention to corn quite a bit. And we're picking up nodal roots. I mean, I've noticed. About every half inch deeper we go, we're picking up one to two more sets of nodal roots. That's a direct feeder straight to the stalk. Um, and it really showed a big difference in our in our tissue sampling as well, where we're putting that corn a little bit deeper because when we get in the summer heat and that ground starts crusting, you know, getting a little dry underneath the cover crops, we're not pulling nutrients out of that, you know, inch or two, but down lower, it's, it's really helping out. Again, you gotta, I mean, the closing systems today are so spectacular, you can get yourself in trouble. If you're out there when it's too wet and you're smearing that sidewall with your, with your uh, double disc opener and that beautiful closing system is slamming that back together and it doesn't rain and it turns, I mean, I can't, there's, there's some Minnesota people here today. I, I imagine it'd be hard for them to remember when it was over a hundred in June in Minnesota. That's going to dry out that seed slot pretty darn quick, and you may not get that cash crop out of the ground. So we got to be very careful on how we pull all this back together. 
So determine your cover crop. Do you use some sort of soil sample to look at your carbon nitrogen ratio to determine what cover crop you're going to be going with? I I do I do not do that. I, I'm looking at what my next cash crop is going to be. I try to figure out, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot going on here because let's say you want to plant a 12-way species. So let's say you call up your, your distributor and you say, send me a thousand acres of this 12-way mix. Well, out of that 12-way mix, there's six of those species that are going to win or kill. It's already pre-mixed. Mother Nature changed her mind on me, and now I can't plant that until November the 20th. I've wasted all that money on six of those species that are going to do me no good. So it's a very difficult juggling act. So what we're doing now is we're, we are getting delivered in the, the product as it is in its own, its own bag. And we're blending and mixing ourselves, de depending on the weather, the time of year, and what our next cash crop is. I'm all about diversity. I probably should pay more attention to that ultimate carbon to nitrogen, but I really care more about diversity and, and getting that cover crop established as soon as we can in the fall. I'm using the Haney test. Um, if you've got a slow soil system, you know, something that high CEC, nutrients aren't an issue, you can hold them in place, roughly around a 12 to 15 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio in the soil solution. You know, if you went to a 20 to one in that, you're, you're gonna see tie up. You know, part of Rick's test, 20 to one in that system. If you come down in the Southeast where I am, we're warmer, we're cycling more often, um, you get a sandier soil where we're going to leach more nutrients and we need that to spoon feed even longer. We'll start pushing up to that 15 to 20 to one. Um, and, you know, Rick does make a, a recommendation and that's all it is on his test on what your cover crop should be. But it's, it's like Rick said, it's very dependent on what your next cash crop is going to be. If I'm going to corn and I need nutrients available, I'm probably going to bring my cover crop carbon to nitrogen ratio down. So, uh, 35 to 40 to one cover crop nitrogen ratio and where I'm at, we see it, you know, that cover crop residue will break down in one season. If I'm going to soybeans and I need nutrients later in when I'm doing pod fill, we'll take some legumes out, bump up the small grain and, and push it to where we're getting to that R2, R3 and beans before we start seeing any breakdown because I'm nodulating the whole season. So I really don't need to push extra nutrients into that soybean plant until I'm starting to set pods and starting to make beans. And so that's kind of how we make our determination. Let me follow up with that though. Um, and we got this question in the last session. If you were at 101 making your first decision about cover crops, talk about that line of, of thinking. And, you know, we kind of skipped over principles too of, of regenerative agriculture. So could you guys speak a little bit about um, how understanding the principles helped you get started? And sorry, this is a really long question. What was the first cover crop that you did? Like, let's right. talk about that first step. I always talk about success, that, oh, that first time out, tillage radish. I did okay. some research on the internet. I found that I figured out the tillage radish it will winter kill in the region that I farm in, and there'll be nothing to deal with next spring except the residue from that radish. And that's exactly what I want. Got very lucky, planted corn and no till corn into that field. It was the best corn on the farm that fall. That's what got me started. Now, the second part of your question was I'm sorry. Um, how did you use the principles to guide yes. decisions. Um, yeah, I did not go into each principle in depth and, and I, I apologize for that, I probably should have, but I take these principles very seriously. Diversity, uh, minimize disturbance, I've taken that to the nth extreme and I've actually eliminated disturbance. And, and I can really start to see that the soil's changing, 
lead pressures changing, everything goes through a progression. And we it takes time, but the progression would be broad leaves will be first, then grasses, and then you'll be out of this. And that's what I see happening. We don't have a lot of broad leaf pressures. We do have grass pressure right now. So then you try to change those trigger points. Let's plant wheat and harvest that wheat off right when the foxtails get ready to think about starting, then follow wheat with a, another cocktail to help smother that foxtail out. So principals, I, I heed their advice very seriously. And it is always in part of my calculations on what we're gonna do. So kind of where we start with cover crops, if we grow it for a cash crop, it's not a cover crop. Um, there's a lot of wheat in our area. Wheat's a cheap seed to buy. But ultimately, if you look at all the small grains that we have in our toolbox, it probably has one of the worst root systems. So, you know, if I'm talking to a producer starting out, if they're scared of the biomass or they're worried about having planter issues with the biomass of rye, go with triticale. At least triticale has a good root system on it. The carbon to nitrogen ratio is a, is a little bit higher than wheat, but it's a little bit lower than rye. So we can kind of monitor that, um, you know, that CDN ratio. I at least like to see one legume in the mix. Typically it's crimson clover. Um, you don't have to really worry about a lot of the hard seed issues that hairy vetch have. So we're not seeing, you know, hairy vetch coming in, you know, you know, different years later. Um, and then also like a brassica, we started with radishes. Um, we started with radishes. I want to see a broadleaf go through the year because, or through the winter at least, because where I'm at, radishes were dying out in December, but we weren't getting the size on them, the taproot that I wanted to see. It was costing me about four or five dollars an acre for the, you know, the two pounds of radishes we were using. So we switched to a pound of like a, a dwarf Essex rate. Um, we're still seeing really good taproots on it. It's surviving the winter for me and it cost a dollar an acre. Um, so a very cheap mix, triticale, crimson clover, and a pound of radish or a pound of a pound of rape. So, I mean, the first mix that we ever planted was designed by my NRCS employee, and it was cereal rye, triticale, oats, crimson clover, and winter peas. Um, it, it did really good for us. The mistake I made is I think we planted like 100 pounds to the acre the first year. And, you know, it was so thick, we probably should have bailed it. I mean, it would have probably made great feed if you had cows, but we did at that time, so we terminated it and planted through it. Um, I got there in a hurry because I is how, the question is how long did it take us to scale up the farm? Um, I I saw the benefits early in this process and I went fast. Four years, the whole farm was there. Uh, that's no-till cover crop. Then it was another four to start pulling inputs away. So you got to be in eight, 10 years to then start pulling some of this stuff away. Or at least, yeah, at least decreasing what you're, you're applying. You know, I mean, Russell uses a little bit of, of herbicide, a little bit of fertilizer, but he's way down from where he used to be. Way down. And we can all get there. Our, 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 I'd say our county average you guys are putting out 200 to 225 units of nitrogen. Um, you know, we can go over 200 bushel corn with 60 units of nitrogen. Um, looking at, you know, organic matter breakdown, looking at nitrogen that we're building through the cover crop legumes and, and seeing that on the Haney test. Um, and then at the end of the year, we're still pulling stalk nitrate samples. I think that's a big thing. I am a big proponent of that. It's a, it's kind of like a report card for farmers. Most farmers that I do know don't pull um, stalk nitrate samples. Um, and, you know, even when we've had some of our highest yielding corn, our, our, our nitrate samples are still high. You know, nutrients are not my limiting factor. Most of the time it's moisture. Too much. What did you do, Russell? What did you do organic that? Sandy ground, um, I've seen it as low as half percent. Um, Native forest where I'm at is about 1.82. Um, we've had farms that we picked up at 2%. And, and when I say extreme management, I mean, 
planting a month later than my neighbors and shortening from 120 day corn to 105 day corn. And we've done trials where we're not sacrificing yield by shortening up our growing season a little bit, but where we're getting 10, 12,000 pounds of dry biomass in our samples, rolling that down, livestock integration. If we do a winter cash crop like wheat, oats, uh, barley, um, instead of planting double crop beans or Dave Brent calls them greedy beans, we'll come back and plant a summer mix, cattle graze. Um, we've seen some of our ground above 6% organic matter now. Um, so you, you definitely can change it, but it comes back to how much you want to manage it. So, so what Durbin's talking about is, uh, you know, a lot of farmers pull uh, nitrate sampling for their top dress nitrogen to figure out if they need it or not. That is one of the things I'll say has been key to Haney's test on our farm is as our soils have progressively gotten healthier, our organic nitrogen, which you don't get at all on a nitrate sample, actually start getting at least a 50 to a one to one ratio to inorganic to organic or even higher. And I would say average on our farm, we're probably seeing, you know, 10 pounds of nitrate nitrogen, but we may have 60 or 70 pounds of organic nitrogen. And if you can save 60 or 70 pounds of nitrogen application, I mean, especially this year, uh, we saw nitrogen back home, they tripled in price. Um, it went from about 250 a ton up to over $700 a ton. So, you know, definitely seeing that Haney test and getting that whole picture. And Rick talked about it in the last group. And a lot of farmers don't think about this. If you apply a synthetic form of nitrogen, that plant has to take it up. It then has to take water, sunlight, and energy from that plant to convert it to a plant available form. If we're using organic forms of nitrogen, it's plant available. And so I am using less water to grow the same crop. And, and instead of that crop using energy and, and moisture to convert nitrogen, I'm packing on yield. And so those are, those are pretty big for us in dry years. I'm not smart enough for sap yet. Um, one day they will make a, a coloring book with sap analysis and then I'll, I'll yeah, one-on-one for dummies and sap, but that sap is, sap is a great thing. And, and I'm learning a little bit about it. Um, I don't know if the guy's really smart. I heard it from, but, um, you know, I'm learning about sap and, yeah, but you know, we'll eventually get there. There's a question over. Speak up just a little bit for me. Right. Possibly. Uh, how do we terminate the legume package ahead of corn is the first question. Um, we, we try to be patient and we have to wait until that legume is at the point where it can be terminated. So hairy vetch is like half bloom. Uh, Balanza fixation clover, I wait till you start to see a little brown around the, the perimeter of the, of the buds or the blooms. And then it's ready to be roll crimp terminated. Now, it's uh, at that point, it's probably 20 to one nitrogen ratio. It's gonna disappear very quickly. So four weeks, probably it's gonna be gone or at least over half gone. Um, and what was the other, the other part of the question? Yeah, just slow the clover down. You gotta be very careful here because when, and we're only talking about planting five or six pounds of each of these in the fall, five pounds of clover, five pounds of vetch, and you're gonna get 12,000 pounds of biomass. If you don't get that down fairly low in a hurry for that corn, it's gonna smother that corn and the corn will not get out of it. So what we're trying to do now, is, are we about out of time? Yeah. yeah. What we're trying, I'm sorry, Russell, I'm, I'm hogging this You way. go ahead. What we're trying to do We've got a lot of acres to get across. So what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm frost seeding 
a legume in April. And I'm trying to get the timing so that when we're planting corn, that legumes a, that the new legume is about this tall. And then when the corn gets to V5, it's like you interseeded the legume that, that there's a tool over there for interseeding. So I'm trying to, to, to do the interseeding without actually doing the, the process. We're broadcasting and cross seeding earlier in the, in the, in the spring. Yeah, so that's just ways to try to try to change the calendar a little bit. So this group's going to move to the show ring. We're, we're, our, not, our slope at home is uh, one and a half, two percent. Okay. Yeah, no, no I, nothing like that. I have fields I have to empty the combine on each pass. I actually, my first combine was a 1660. We were about half full in the bin. And if I would have had mud hog, I would have quit. So, <laughs> yeah. So this group here, you guys are heading to biological. And Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.